This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. It's, um, I've only spoken to scientists, I think, once before, and I was consumed with nerves at the time, I'm sure. I may, I may well be consumed with nerves uh, this, on this occasion. It's hard for me to do, uh, and I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not used to it, but I'll try my best. Um, parts of it will be written, and uh, parts of it will be uh, informally invented. <laughs> but I began a, a bit of reminiscence. I've been told by a psychoanalyst that these reminiscences of artists are always wrong. But uh, I've clung to this one. When I began to grow up in Crewe, and I was about four years old during the dying days of the Second World War, and the uh, Luftwaffe were bombing crew because it was uh, the center of the rail network and my grandfather was a uh, stoker in the Rolls-Royce Aero work, um, which was also a, a target, obviously. And although I usually slept in my own bed by then, age, say, four, three or four, on, when there were air raids on, the safest place in a small Cottage 123 Warmingham Road, Cotton Hall, Crew, Cheshire, is under the stairs because all the bricks will fall down and the, the wooden structure, and I make wooden structures, we're in a wooden structure to a certain extent. Wooden structures have a certain strength. So I was um, to sleep with my mother again and under the stairs. Oscar Wilde said, um, it was, uh, some of us are in the gutter and other of us are looking up at the stars. I think by gutter, it's rather a euphemism, he meant shit really, because in those days, the gutters were full of shit. So he was really saying, some of us are lying in the shit. All of us are lying in the shit rather, but some of us are looking up at the stars. But I was looking up at the stairs. <laughs> and, um, my stairs, of course, were uh, uncovered in and were in reverse, like the shapes that I used. They were, they were not trapezoids, but they were perspective in reverse. They were stairs that you could only climb if you're a fly or a spider. So I, I think that might have been an inspiration to be in that particular moment. And when they're trying to kill you, it perhaps makes your mind strong. And uh, I felt in this tiny world of mine, I found little moments of wonder in the front room. The front room in the uh, working class was a room you didn't use. We only had four rooms. The back room, the front room, the front bedroom and the back bedroom. But the front room wasn't used at all. If the doctor would have come, he might have seen you in the front room. It was a, a tiny museum and it included, amongst other reversepective things, it included, if, if you like, a hollow head in the sense that it included a peerage plate. Some of you may remember a peerage plate which was a, a brass, uh, in our case, galleons, but on Saturday mornings I had to polish it brass over. But I noticed that it, since it was just an impression of galleons, that from the back the galleon sails didn't have winds in, but it still looked like a galleon. It was uh, like a reverse head, it worked like a reverse head. And also in that, that small room, there was uh, a mirror over the fireplace, and there was a mirror over the um, dresser, and uh, one could stand in the middle, and one was, as a small child, uh, as you might be introduced in uh, some barber shops, introduced to Infinity, which is um, a distant friend of mine, Infinity, because Infinity lies behind uh, perspective. So that, that uh, tiny room and those uh, childhood experiences may have uh, prompted my interest in it. Another childhood memory, maybe these are all false, was since we lived in, in London, in High East Middlesex, and my grandparents lived in Crewe then, I had to travel by train uh, to see them on my own. And you might get to somewhere like Rugby, and you'd be sitting in the station, and the train, the London train to rugby would go out. And you'd think, oh, we're going to crew. But we weren't. We were stationed there. And that, um, 
aspect of relative motion, as Luther hinted, is a part of my work, that when you move past them for various reasons, you say they're moving. They're not moving, you're moving. And uh, Eddington uh, wrote in uh, 1928, and Tom Stoppard used it in jumpers, everything that leads you to believe that uh, the train is leaving Paddington would be just as true as Paddington leaving the train. So that, that relative motion was a, uh, another uh, a chart of memory. But then, in, um, I'm going to come back to this now. Um, my, where I come from, if you like, people sometimes say to me, did you study architecture or perspective drawing? <coughs> On the contrary, somebody who would have studied architecture or perspective drawing wouldn't do what I did, which was to kick over the traces. Perspective drawing and architecture is done right. And what I do, and have always wanted to do, is do wrong. Um, so the culture that I come from, the icons of, of my uh, disbelief, are these things like uh, Man Ray's Caddo of uh, 1924. We know that Man Ray went into the uh, hardware shop and made it on the occasion of a Dada exhibition. Of course, it's um, contradictory in the sense it wouldn't improve your shirt. It was meant to make your shirt better than does it. And um, similarly, uh, Mary Oppenheim's uh, a Déjeuner en Fourrure of uh, 1936 has a, a terrific... I interviewed her for, I think it's for Vogue, I mean, or Har no, I interviewed her for Harper's. And I said to her, uh, and she's, this has been written elsewhere, but I did get it from the horse's mouth. I said, how come you made it and what happened? And she said, I was invited to be in a surrealist show at, at Charles Ratton Gallery in 1936. And I, uh, it, it's so uh, chic and uh, a little bit like uh, Midnight in Paris with Wood, uh, Woody Allen's wonderful film. She said, I was in the cafe with my girlfriend, Dora Barr, and uh, his, uh, her boyfriend, uh, Pablo Picasso. <laughs> and uh, I was wearing <coughs> earrings that I'd made for Elsa Schiaparelli, which were fur. And I had on a fur bracelet, and Picasso, who was always on, said, what's that, then, Mary? What, are you, what have you what's what you got there? She said, oh, it's a fur bracelet. And what are those? A fur earring. And Picasso said, well, we could have a fur door, or we could have a fur chair. And Mary said, yeah, we could have a fur cup and saucer and spoon. And that's, that's how it came to be at that. Not would there were more moments like that. And this is um, my, the title really of my uh, picture in the British Library of my self-published book is Paradoximoron. And uh, one of my theoretical arguments is that the oxymoron is a condensed paradox or leads to paradox. And an oxymoron is, um, you know, loud silence or living death from uh, Milton. And uh, the adjective contradicts the noun, as in uh, oxy in Greek is sharp and moros is dull. It's a sharp dullness. That, and this is, of course, uh, the material uh, represented the adjective fur and the noun, the thing, the, the cup and sauce and spoon. So this is where I was coming from as an, an artist. This is a... a uh, another great work from um, 1937 by Marcel Marien, who was a great um, mate, young follower of Magritte. And he had the um, wisdom when he broke his glasses, this was an accident, to say to the optician, would you make me a, not a pair, but a, a single turn? And it, of course it's wonderfully, um, it's about vision, isn't it? And it's wonderfully... Um, it in, it was, its implication is wonderful. It talks about a cyclops suddenly with a very thin head, rather strange <laughs> facial recognition. With one of these things. <laughs> so these, this was my, as an artist, was my world with um, Magritte's um, black light. You know, sometimes people would say. Um, <coughs> 
a divine, I think it was Sir Thomas Brown, said, uh, light is really inspired by God. Light is the shadow of God. You know, and, and the idea of, of darkness and light is perhaps the deepest and most profound of our metaphors, we can call it that. And here, Magritte has imagined that uh, black light, darkness visible. <coughs> and he was one of my uh, mentors. I was saying to Uta that I, I disagree with uh, Colin, that I knew maybe three or four thousand pictures of Magritte, and I didn't see one when I was about 30. But I knew them as reproductions. I speak up for the reproduction. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to be inspired by these things. It's great that they're in books. It's a very good place for them. Books are good. <laughs> I've been to Washington to see... Maybe it's the next one. No, it's coming up. This is solid light, which is, uh, or solid space rather, which is a kind of a theme of mine. I make solid lumps of space, I, I guess. I've been to Washington to see this. It's a little bit dull when you see it, <laughs> and yet it's my, uh, it's my alma mater, it's my preferred picture, I suppose, because I wanted to say snottily that I think Wittgenstein and the Duck Rabbit was extremely ill-informed. Because this is 1933 or 4, and Wittgenstein, if he'd have been intimate with French surrealism, could have known about this picture, which is a much more visually interesting, paradoxical and peculiar picture than the mere Duck Rabbit. It's a duck, it's a rabbit. Who cares? <coughs> this is... This is Magritte is taking um, dull realism, maybe as Pirandello took it, and turning it against itself. It's like six characters in search of an author in a way. Mm. That he's, he's taking this ordinary realism and turning it against itself. He's saying, uh, the artist is saying, look, I've painted a really accurate picture of that little tree and that path. But in saying he's done it, he's denying us the opportunity of finding out if he has done it. Because he's covered up the may It might be that Colin Blake was there with the Queen going past. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. Or well, that tree might have fallen down. You know, any, anything. So it's it's um, a wonderful paradoxical picture because they say this is the truth but as it says this is the truth it could perfectly well be a lie marvelous uh, picture and and it's it's double if you like from 1948 the i know that i, I apologize it's all these pictures are quite well known um escher's uh, hand drawing a hand um which is when the paradox uh, comes from the oxymoron, in brief I would say the oxymoron is this is a true lie. And the paradox is this sentence is a lie. It's a sort of, it's not a, when I say this is a true lie, that's a figure of speech, it's almost metaphorical. But when I say, as this picture kind of says, this is a true lie, if it is true, it is a lie, and if it is a lie, it is true, in a, as this suggests, in a circular way. And um, besides being a lover of the, uh, the oxymoron, I am a lover of the circle, perhaps, and there is a circularity in, in my pictures, you know, because they're made in the way in which we see things, and then we see them. So it's like an, uh, um, an interference pattern. It goes around in the circle. It's an odd thing to do. If we made this room uh, in perspective, you know, the way we see it, it's a really funny thing. And people <coughs> have done that since the 16th century. We'll come to that. This is another um, oxbyronic kind of piece. It's uh, about 1963 by the great uh, Klaus Oldenburg. It's the, his collapsed 
uh, drunk. They say of sculptors that their um, uh, body image is reflected in their work. You know, so Henry Moore was like that. <laughs> Albert Epstein was like that. <laughs> and uh, Oldenburg was a kind of big floppy guy. <laughs> and I've got, I'm all, I'm all uh, elbows. <laughs> Sometimes it's, uh, the, the oxymoron and the, uh, and the uh, contradictory object exists, exists in, in, other, in other cultures. This is from um, a piece from 1878. It was uh, by a real wright called Alphonse Bonquet in um, France. And uh, Andre Breton found it in a flea market. And they, they used to say to the wheelwright when he passed his wheelwright exam, now make an oval wheel you know, to show that you have absolute capacity. So it's not that's how it is. It's not in, in perspective. It's like that. Super thing. An oval wheel. And and in the joke shop, you can pick up liquids. Then to revert to my own history, this that's some background if you like. Um, I don't know if I've missed out. Oh yeah, no, I've missed out. No. Do you remember cloakroom tickets? Not that, um, unfortunately, sometimes things go out. But this was part one of my. This is a piece of mine that's 62 of a cloakroom. It's a little bit like it occurred to me much later on. Um, another of Magritte's great pieces of 1929. The um, this is not a pipe. You know, it's known as this not a pipe. Um, but let me small. That's the s sort of person I am to, to contradict. Really. Well, this is a circle of mine. Um, <laughs> some fanatical DIY guys do actually do that when they put their very small extensions away in case the electricity gets out. You know. <laughs> <laughs> It is actually a, um, a, a, a sort of modern version of the Ouroboros. So the snake eating its own tail uh, is, uh, if you look at it, one is the eating end and the other is the tail end. And in fact, it was a little bit similar when the um, electrical cable was made like that with those marks. Electrical cable is snaky stuff that lies on the floor and will bite your ass if you're not careful. And they rather did mirror the snake in the in the manufacture. It doesn't do it. It was woven. But, but I suppose they were thinking this is the sort of bite you could get from it. It's a very nasty bite. And there's another sort of um, circle of mine from uh, the 19 about 1970. The train, the train theme, you know, going round and round and round. That's what happens in um, Ouroboruses and, and uh, paradoxes that they just keep going around. Th this is how I started in the world of re-perspective. It was um, in 19... I'll read a bit. In 1963, I stood on the platform in Leeds Station waiting for the London train. That's the best train I have in Leeds. At this time, I never used perspective in my work. It was like the cloakroom ticket. And I rather resented it. I thought of uh, perspective as a part of realism, just a visual phenomenon. And up to this point, I painted things flatly. I did. Uh, I painted so flatly. I painted uh, a clown that had been run over by a steamroller. You know, I, 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 and it was a big cutout, ten foot by four foot, but all squashed. I, I, the way I did it was I made a plasticine clown, which was about that big and rolled it out with my then wife's uh, rolling pin. She wasn't chasing me. And, uh, and I drew a big clown. So I was very flat. But I, I realized I stood on the, um, on the station that uh, these lines came to a point a couple of miles away. So I made it. And I've, I've since remade it. And the virtue of making things is once you've made it, you can look at it again. And so having looked at it, I, you can go around to the other end and see infinity from the vanishing point end. And I was I was pleased to to do this a few a few years later. <coughs>
to see it from the other point of view. If you make a model of your uh, house or flat or garden or whatever, it helps to, to look at it differently. A, a model maker is a good principle. And then I, uh, subsequent to this one, uh, no, subsequent to having done the rebel on 63, in 64, I made this sticking out room. And this was a uh, eureka-like uh, moment, because it shows you how naive I was. I made it, as you would, on the table. I made the, the four sides of the room sticking out and the end side. And it's papered in doll's house wallpaper. And the door is made of um, doll's house bits. And I wanted to make just an oppressive sticking out room, like a rebel line came to a point. And when I put it on the wall, uh, and, oh, it's gone in. You know, I really should have known that, but I was only young. And I thought, oh, that's very good, I've done that. That's, uh, that sticks up, it seems to go in. And I didn't return to it for many years, unfortunately. Uh, but that was the first time I saw it. And um, I would, the world of perspective was revolutionized, so far as I can make out, by uh, Viator in 1505, when he, when he wrote perhaps the first book on perspective. And he, there's a big difference between um, a Piero della Francesca and all those guys who do central perspective, which this is, and Viator had the insight to do it, uh, look into one side or look into the other. I forgot what that word is. But uh, that's what I live on now. So that in the uh, picture you'll see later on of um, the Grand Canals, it's got two or three of these sticking out ends. But it, it means to say you can look there or look there and follow different ways. In, in central perspective, you're just guided straightforwardly, but Viator's great insight was, well, you could look over there, or you could look over there. I wanted to give him a compliment. Well, <laughs> Magritte said, people used to sometimes say to Magritte, what do your pictures mean? And he said, well, I don't like symbolism. And um, I don't really. And I, I particularly, uh, one of my uh, bet noirs is the, uh, happens in America at uh, at New Year's time, at New Year, when they have Old Father Time with a, um, as a, an hourglass, doesn't it, in a side, and the New Year is a baby in a nappy, you know, they come together and I suppose Old Father Time goes and the New Year comes. Awful, trite, personalized symbolism. But sometimes one's happy enough to find in this painting by Deja Vu, which is from the mid-70s. That's the future, isn't it, in front of you? And that little bit is the past, which you have to abbreviate the past, else it would get in the way of the future. It's much the same in Hughes' vision. It could be the same. And some people, they say some people have a big future <laughs> ahead of them, but behind them. <laughs> but uh, that's such a, a marvellous, uh, unless you're in reverse gear, special case, but mostly <laughs> that's uh, a, a nice um, a symbolism that just happens rather than being concocted in that awful way. There's a picture of, um, <laughs> of how, uh, how I saw myself in those days. There is a movie, I forgot, I have seen it, in which they do go to the lengths of making the station and removing it from the train. It's not very funny, but that's it. <laughs> this, this relative motion uh, was devised. This is, um, I think it's called Cleopatra's Barge, isn't it? Um, I know, it's called The Haunted Swing. And this is from the, um, where lots, so many good things come from, the middle of the 19th century or somewhere. And you got into this swing and they moved the room around you. I've been in the one called the crazy room in uh, Blackpool. And we would all come into the room, be a room much like this, only smaller. And down the middle of the room is a great big steel uh, cylindrical bar. And then there are two lots of um, seats 
and the, uh, the guys running the uh, ride puts a, a big belt in front of you, and you look up at the ceiling and it's scuffed. And you think, we're going up, and there was just this leather belt. Mm -hmm. And he goes outside, and you begin to rise up in the room quite slowly. Sometimes they rock it, but so you go till you're upside down. Everybody's upside down, and then you go around. And uh, the belt is necessary because at a certain moment he stops the ride and he turns the room the other way. And all the people on this side go like that. They've been stationary all the time, but they fall forward and you do need the leather thing to hold them in. And this is an early version of it. And that relative motion is what happens, of course, in my pictures. Just um, a side issue of... Uh, of rainbows. Uh, I did a lot of these rainbows which are gravely misunderstood, I think. People thought that they were terribly opposite. They just thought they were happy or I was in it or both. And um, really I wanted to say that um, when you pin down a butterfly, if you like, or when you try to um, identify an experience, you can't make an event into a thing. You know, a marriage is not a ring, it's a relationship, isn't it? And I, I wanted to say how absurd to imagine you could collect these. A, relation, a rainbow in the end is a relationship between a person and the sun and globules of water, and it comes and goes as it, it, it can. So I wanted to um, uh, contrast my rainbows with reality, if you like, or I did this prison rainbow. If um, we almost have a quorum here, of, uh, it's sufficient for me to ask the following question. Um, does anybody here think the rainbow is leaving? No, not no. so many optimists. But if you have a number of about 60 people, I often find one person who says, oh yes, the rainbow's getting out of jail. There's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people, aren't they? <laughs> Sadly, none of you are. <laughs> I thought it was coming in. And uh, solid uh, sunshine is a good thing. <coughs> My friend, uh, the, the poet Jeff Nuttall, he's dead now, said the sun came in through the window like a brick. <laughs> this was a piece I did for the um, a play orbit that Yasha Reichart organized at the... Uh, Institute of Contemporary Arts. I thought it would be fun to make a, a, a toy that was a coffee table toy, so I had We Love Reflections, We Surrealists. And I thought I'd have some ducks with their reflections. The top ducks had uh, North, um, uh, what are they called? North um, magnets in their bums. And the bottom ducks had uh, South magnets. So you could sail the uh, duck across, and his, his reflection used to follow rather tardily. Uh, and so they, this duck thinks it's a, a, a swan. But actually what happened, people came along and picked up the top duck, and the bottom duck fell off. Oh. The <laughs> in, one of the things I do, as I said, is to make things in perspective. And this was done, um, in, this is in Vicenza. I, have you been there to see this? It's, uh, a wonderful thing to see. This is uh, the theatre was designed by Palladio, but it wasn't built in his lifetime. And the scenery is by uh, Scamozzi. And uh, similarly, um, I think Martin Kemp sent me a picture of the Borromini Arcade in Rome, which I've been to see, which is also made in perspective. This um, is all made in perspective. So in the early days of perspective. <coughs> They did have the idea of making things in perspective, which is, a, a, as I suggest, a strange step. A stranger one still is to make it in perspective in reverse. They didn't go that far. And this is a marvellous uh, piece that, I've, uh, that you can see in the Met. This is the um, Gubbio studio though in the Met. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's terrific to see. Not a great slide from here. But uh, when you go in on the ground floor to the right, it's sort of Renaissance time. You go into a small room, only three people are allowed in. And uh, you'll see this uh, intarsia structure, which entirely, it's like a painting, but it's made of wood or veneer, and it's all flat. 
And uh, it's all illusionist, and it has these wonderful open doors, which, and I like doors, because they are bits of the world that are meant to move and uh, swing and be hinged. I suspect that the Duke of Montefeltro might have said to some of his supplicants, do sit down on those benches, you know, and they would have fallen down. Sometimes those are, people do play those practical jokes. It's a wonderful thing to see in a hymn, a Renaissance hymn from 1478 to perspective and, il and the illusion of, of space in it. Uh, I'm making one now at, at my version of it. This is an example that you may see as you wake your, as, as this van makes its way around London that these um, crates will move. You know, it's, when, when a picture's made in perspective, it actually should only work from one point of view. Uh, and we accept it from a myriad points of view. Uh, that's part of the theory of this. And this, rather like a, um, a negative head, is unhinged. <coughs> perspective traps everything into one place. All those lines are like a cat's cradle that hold the thing where it is. And because this uh, crate uh, van lorry is uh, a yellow against blue, the yellow crates are free to move. So you will, as it goes past you, you'll see that they will assume different positions because we'll, we'll want to believe that they, that can't be right. And we'll adjust it in our mind and say just a bit that the crates are moving. If they were drawn in a room, they wouldn't move. Five minutes. Of course, the, uh, an, another great example from about um, 1948 at the Escher Hands <coughs> is um, uh, the um, perspective, the trapezoidal window of uh, Albert Ames. Much, much better than hit the Ames room which is merely an anamorphic room. You could, could, they're not interesting anamorphic rooms. If you put your eyes in there, it looks like that. So what? But the trapezoidal window, which is in perspective and turns slowly on a drive, uh, has to do, if you've ever seen one, extraordinary and wonderful things. And I am an heir to him because I work with trapezoids. A trapezoid, I understand, here's a table here, is the Greek word for a table. And the Greeks noticed the tables get thinner at one end and thicker at your end. You know, they, they are, it's like calling a table a perspective table. And uh, the trapezoid is my, um, is my friend. I only work with trapezoids. So, for instance, all these doors are trapezoids and they do, when you go past them, they will open and close and reveal there's a slight problem in this kind of work in that only half of it is in perspective. The other half is landscape. And if you do all doors, which I stared at, that's one sticking out. If you do all doors like this, it's a little bit claustrophobic. These are some of the artistic ideas we have. Um, but they're good, they're, they're, they're good to move. And um, other things one can do in reverse perspective is when you come out, you can go in. I think that uh, Thomas Papaton is going to talk about this. That those set of books there are negative books. They're not books. They're like reverse heads. They're, they're cut in into that. Once you've come out, you can go into that shape. And uh, that's the door too. And that's my latest work. So um, I want to say my theory of why they move uh, to end with, uh, or my theory of um, of you. And don't, I'm not sure that uh, the scientists necessarily accept it. These verticals throughout my work are given by uh, gravity. The reason why this room is like this. It's because of gravity. The floor is like this because of gravity. The ceiling is like this, and the walls are like this because of gravity. <coughs> That's a given. So it's easy for me to make these. 
it got verticals in it, just like everything around it is vertical, even I'm vertical as I fall off. But these angles here that make the trapezoids, they're given by perception. They mean uh, when I'm looking from here, this wall on the, this corner here is longer than that corner, it's going that way. So I've made this because of the top and the bottom in perception. In, in perception. I've made it in perception. And the coming together of those two things make that. Now why it moves, in my belief, it, and it's a horrible word, I think, is to do with the proprioception. But you must judge it when you look at, say, the Venice thing. Or that sense of our, our body sense. Because as you move past it, you, as you move past this picture, you see more of the wrong bit and less of the right bit. And it's, it's, your eyes are telling you one thing, it's hard to say in front of this, and your feet are telling you another. And that's intolerable because you, I've cut you in half. And what you have to say of the Venice picture downstairs is it must be moving. And you say it's moving because otherwise your legs are lying to your eyes. That's my vision of what I want. That's the end. Thank you very much.